Now, we all know leading during disruptive change feels perilous, but Jim Mason, the president and CEO of Beach Acres Parenting Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, is here to share how he recovered his own sense of purpose to lead his organization in a new direction and toward a more significant future. For our disruptive forces, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Mr. Jim Mason. Put this right here. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Good. I hope you're doing well after I get finished. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own story in uh, leading Beach Acres. There we go. Uh, my own personal story in leading Beach Acres, and I hope it resonates with some of you. For you who it doesn't resonate with, maybe you want to just take a little 15-minute snooze. But I'm hoping that there's something in there for everybody. My second grade, or my seventh grade English teacher gave us a creative writing assignment. My career in blank. I had no idea. How many of you knew what you wanted to be as an adult in seventh grade? You know what I wrote? Baseball. My career in Major League Baseball. I wrote three pages about baseball. The bottom of it, I said, just in case I can't be a baseball player, baseball coach. <laughs> and if I can't be a baseball coach, social worker. Social worker. I had no idea what it was, but that's what I put, and I got a B. <laughs> so when I was in high school, my friends all came to me with their problems. It's, Girlfriends, drugs, parents, grades, you name it, I fixed it. I was a happy little problem solver. They all love me. But you know what? I didn't see a whole lot of future in being nice. People don't get paid for being nice. So when I went to college, I decided to major in business administration because my dad wore a tie to work. Well, any of you old enough remember the 60s back then. It was a time of idealism was rampant across campuses, war protest, civil rights, women's lib. I was into all of it. I had a special place in my heart, though, for vulnerable kids. I didn't know why, I just did. So I switched my major from business to education, graduated, became a school teacher, went to graduate school, probation officer, residential treatment worker, all steps along a path that I thought would somehow help me help more kids, help me achieve that college dream that we all had of changing the world. Well, I got my big break in 1989 when I was working at the Beach Acres, a general Protestant orphan home, a proud 140-year-old orphanage. The executive director was leaving to take on a job in some other state, and I decided to go for his job. I vividly remember the day before my final interview, I'm laying in my bed, looking up at the ceiling. My wife says, what are you thinking about? Oh, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do if I get Bob's job. Oh, really? What's that? I'm going to tear down those god-awful curtains and paint his office. It's disgusting. <laughs> She's like, oh, how about the second day? You know what? That was a great question. I, I didn't really know. Well, I knew we had a crummy culture. I needed to fix that. And we needed a new strategic plan. But beyond that, I didn't really know. So I jumped into doing what I always tried to do best, read voraciously. But you know what? I never found the book that I was really looking for. How to be a great executive director, change the world, and have everybody love you. So I took that job and I did what I thought all great executive directors do, get more contracts. We closed residential treatment, we jumped into community-based services, we had a program for every dollar that was thrown our way. We grew in staff size, grew in budget, served more kids. By all external matters of measurement, we were a great success, we had a wonderful reputation in the community. 
I was obviously a wonderful chief executive. Thank you. <laughs> my board even changed my title from executive director to president and CEO. But why was I still so dissatisfied? I just couldn't escape the sense that the more we did, the less impact it had. The problems that kids were having were just keep getting worse. It felt like I was sticking my finger in a dike. I want to be something, part of something bigger, not just feel like I'm competing with all my friends to see who got to put the biggest Band-Aid on a hemorrhage. So we decided to hire a strategic planning consultant. That'll fix it. She went out, she did all this data collection, she came back and she said, Jim, I know what the problem is. Oh great, tell me please, please. Social services is the broom behind the parade of humanity. Oh my God. I thought, that's terrible. We're cleaning up the mess from all the rest of society. But it felt so true. I wanted to be ahead of that parade. I wanted to do something farther upstream. About that time, Beach Acres Reputation got us invited to take over a managed care track contract, a failing contract for the county that was not doing well. Its goals, improve clinical results and reduce costs for the community's most troubled kids. Boy, for anybody that was an aspiring CEO, that's like throwing meat at a junkyard dog. If we could be successful in that kind of a contract, we would be open to endless opportunities. We jumped in, tripled the size of our budget, doubled the size of our ta staff. We were all in, the center of the provider community serving these most complex kids. It almost killed us. Sure, we had improved the outcomes for the kids, but we got totally hammered financially. I should have seen the, the, the warning light when it took so long to negotiate the contract. I should have seen the warning light when, it, when we didn't have influence over our own admission and discharge criteria. And I should have seen the warning light when our staff were unable to deny care to kids that needed it the most, thus driving up my costs. These were all warning lights along the path. I didn't see them. Staff saw them, they told me, but I didn't listen. I was too locked into my big idea. One of them told me years later, said, you know what, Jim? We always knew when to shut up because when we said something you didn't like, your whole face just turned red as a beet. And we're like, okay, he's done, bye. But you know what the biggest thing in all that process that I lost? My own voice. My own voice for what I stood for. We closed that program. I vividly remember the day that I laid off 50 people and booked $5 million in losses. It was the worst day of my career. I remember curling up in a ball in my bed wondering, how did I get us into this? I was racked with self-doubt. I thought, isn't bigger better? Isn't that what we do? Grow, grow, grow? Even if it's not aligned with who we are or what our competencies are? Well, for the first time in my career, I started entertaining headhunter calls. I got three fives in the finals of three jobs, CEO jobs in out of state. They all wanted to know what my vision was. Well, I had nothing to lose, so my creative juices just started going, right? The clarity of my answer astonished me. Given the uncertainty and volatility of the dawning 21st century, there is nothing more important to preparing children for their futures than being growing up with capable parenting. Whether that parenting is provided by their birth parent, adoptive, foster, grandparent, kin, or some other dedicated adult who genuinely loves them. Parenting. 
I knew that answer had come way down in here. But what did it mean to me? What did it mean to Beach Acres? What did it mean to my career? I found myself standing at the edge of my own personal cliff. It was a really scary place to be. A lot scarier than this one looks. But it was a real place, a real opportunity for clarity and focus if I could figure out what it meant. You know, I was offered one of those jobs. I decided not to take it. I realized that I didn't need to take a new job to do what I needed to do. I just needed to believe in what I was doing and then do it. Maybe I could do it right here at Beach Acres. Well, we were looking at our services and in evaluating that old managed care experiment, realized with those kids that the kids that we had had the most clinical success with were the ones that we had meaningful engagement of their parents or dedicated adults. You're all out there going, duh, wake up. Well, also at that time, we were celebrating our 150th anniversary. That's a long time to be alive, 150 years. What have we learned in 150 years makes all the difference to a kid growing up to be a capable adult? Well, when you're in orphanage, parenting is in your DNA. So we decided to have a parenting conference. We thought maybe we'd get 300 people. We hoped for it, but we were kind of nervous about it, to be honest with you. When we opened the doors, a thousand people showed up. Wow, maybe we're onto something. Maybe this is a green light showing us some direction that we might be able to move ahead of that parade that the consultant had insulted us with so many years before. I remember going into my attic along about that time and cleaning out an old box of memorabilia from my youth. In one of the boxes, I found a, a paper written by some seventh grade kid about being a major league baseball player. No, being a social worker. But I was realizing what being a social worker really meant to me. And I was also realizing that I had traded my childhood passion of making a big change in the world for an adult world of RFPs and funding screen schemes and CEO trappings. That I was bidding out my passion to anybody that'd give me enough money to do their bidding to do what they wanted me to do, whether I believed in it or not, or thought we were good at it or not. I was managing myself from the outside in I wasn't leading from the inside out. Well, as an agency, we started thinking about what does parenting really mean? What do we believe about parenting? And you know what? Parenting is in our DNA. Every, it's biological. Parents, at their very core, love their kids, want what's best for them. That is how biology works. And we all have barriers to getting there. If we could create an environment for any parent to really see what their real unique natural best self is and what that real unique natural best self of their children is and remove the barriers that are in the way of doing that, maybe we could make a difference. We're starting to see more green lights on our path. Do you remember that movie, City Slickers, when Curly says to Billy Crystal, the one thing, you got to know the one thing? What's the one thing? Well, that's for you to figure out. We were figuring out that our one thing was intentional parenting. We were, if the cliff awaited, if we were willing to take the risk. But we first had to ask a lot of, answer a lot of tough questions like, can we really shift our focus from working with the kids to working with their parents? What would that do to our programs? What do parents really need? What do they want? 
Are we willing to provide it? Are we able to provide it? And the granddaddy of them all, how are we going to pay for this stuff? Well, it took a while to answer those questions, but the more we answered them, the clearer we got, and we started attracting the kind of revenue and staff that made a difference. It was hard transition, our budget that went down two-thirds. We now operate on a third of the money that we had when we had our big managed care contract. But you know what? We now serve four times the number of kids and families. And we're doing that. The results of that are improved uh, foster care reunification, improved mental health outcomes, better school performance, and higher levels of kindergarten readiness. All because we have put parents at the center of our work in a meaningful way. At the board meeting at which we made the dis final decision to become a parenting center, one of our staff members was commenting about the gap between our vision and where we currently were at the time, lamenting a little bit. One of our senior board members st said to her, Sally, if you say you're a parenting center, you are a parenting center. We had stepped off the strategy cliff. Do I still wonder about financing and growing the business and all that stuff? Nah, just kidding. <laughs> that was my one joke. Of course I do, it's as miserable as it is for everybody. This isn't a panacea. But you know what, the clarity that we have, the clarity of purpose and the clarity of what we're good at contributing has made all the difference in the world. We have stepped off the strategy cliff and my face is no longer red as a beet. Now, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. You can believe it or not, you might think I'm nuts. Probably am, my wife confirms it every day. And I'm not here to tell you the cliff diving's for everybody. I'm not here to tell you all, to, all ought to be a parenting center. No, that's not the point. But what I've learned in this process is that there is a desperate need for authentic leadership um, from our staff, from our families, in our communities, and in society. And it's each of our responsibility to figure out what Curly said, what is our one thing as a leader? I feel so blessed that I had the opportunity to take the time to do that, to figure out my authentic purpose. You know, I only did it because I was thrown into an abyss. But my moment of truth has given me the courage to step off that strategy cliff. And more importantly, it's given my organization the courage to be really clear about who we are and what we have to contribute to that youthful vision of changing the world. After all, isn't that what we're all here for? Thanks. Did I run over my question? Great job, Jim. Thanks. So just a quick question for you, Jim. I'm, I'm sorry you weren't born with a baseball gene. I know, but, me too. Well, but it seems like you, you were definitely born with that gene that leads you to care about people. And I'm wondering for you and people who do the work that you do, facing all these challenges that you faced, is that something you have to be born with, or can that be learned and taught? I think it can be learned and taught, David. I, I think our life experiences create in us the things that make us aware of, the, of humanity and of our responsibility to humanity and create empathy. So I, don't th I think some people are born with it, but um, I think it's more about a learning process. You know, it's the old genetics and environmental piece. Um, I know many people who weren't born with it, but their life circumstances have awakened their eyes to the power of helping others. So, Jim Mason, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks again, Appreciate Jim. it. Good job.